Hi, everyone. I'd like to begin on time. I'm sure that people will trickle in from the outside, but um, I don't want to fall behind in our schedule. If I can help it. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce Stephen Barr, Stephen M. Barr, who is professor of physics and director of the Bartholes Research Center at the University of Delaware. <clears throat> he received his PhD from Princeton University in 1978. He does research in theoretical particle physics with an emphasis primarily on grand unified theories and the cosmology of the early universe. He also writes and lectures extensively on the relation of science and religion. Many of those articles and reviews have appeared in First Things, on whose advisory council he serves. He has many scientific journal articles, the titles of which are not fully comprehensible to me. <laughs> so I'm going to limit myself. <laughs> to mentioning the three books that have titles a layman like me can understand and are directly relevant to our conference. Modern Physics and Ancient Faith from 2003 is kind of a classic, a very standard book to find now on syllabi in theology classes, <clears throat> philosophy classes. A Student's Guide to Natural Science from 2006, and Science and Religion, The Myth of Conflict, with an emphasis on the word myth from 2011. Professor Barr was elected to the Academy of Catholic Theology in 2010 and a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2011. He also is the 2016 recipient of the Cardinal Wright Award from the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars. He was a judge of the Templeton Prize for 2013 to 14. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society for original contributions to grand unified theories, CP violation, and baryogenesis. See what I mean about the title of articles. <laughs> and he has the Benemerenti Medal, which was awarded by Pope Benedict XVI in 2006. Professor Barr has been kind of a fellow traveler with the Institute for Church Life for the last several years, something which we're very proud of and something which we've benefited greatly from, his contributions and his, and his wisdom in all of our programs. He will speak to us today on the title, Is the Human Mind Reducible to Physics? And I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Barr. Thank you, John, and thank you to the Institute and uh, all who uh, were involved in inviting me here and organizing this conference. It's a, a great honor to be here, and I'm learning a lot from the other talks. Uh, where in lies our dignity? The scriptural answer is that we are made in the image of God. Explaining this, St. Irenaeus of Lyon wrote that man is rational and therefore like God. He is created with free will and is master over his acts. Indeed, the church has always taught that rationality and freedom are the two powers that make us spiritual beings. And these powers are inseparable. Free will is the capacity to make choices for reasons and not merely from blind impulse. And conversely, the power of reason presupposes an intellect that is free with respect to material, merely material causes. If our minds were entirely controlled by factors of a lower order, as animals are, we could not be open to realities of a higher order, such as truth, goodness, and beauty. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the human being, in his openness to truth and beauty, his sense of moral goodness, his freedom, and the voice of his conscience, finds evidence of his spiritual soul, which is irreducible to the merely material. But this conception of man is not as plausible to many people today as it once was. Reductive theories abound that claim that human beings are nothing more 
in the product of biological and social evolution, of genes and the environment, of instincts and social conditioning, of the wiring of the brain and the chemistry of hormones and neurotransmitters. In other words, merely material factors. The belief that human beings have spiritual souls has been under attack for a long time by philosophers, scientists, and even some theologians. The basis of that attack is a philosophical idea called physicalism or materialism. I'll use the terms interchangeably. This philosophy maintains that all things, including human beings, are completely explicable in physical terms. In, according to physicalists, we humans are nothing but enormously complicated biochemical machines. This idea has deep historical roots. The predictable motions of the heavenly bodies led very early to the idea that the astronomical universe is a clock-like mechanism. This was already a common idea among medieval thinkers. In the 17th century, as it became clear that terrestrial phenomena like celestial ones, are governed by precise mathematical laws, the idea began to emerge that plants, animals, and even the human body can also be understood as machines. This was the view of Descartes, though he drew the line at the human spiritual soul, whose immateriality he continued to affirm. But the more radical thinkers of the Enlightenment, including Hobbes, La Maitrie, and Baron Dolbach, went further. They denied the soul and its freedom and asserted that man in his entirety is mechanical. Such thoroughgoing physicalism was st probably still rare in the 18th century, but it has gained enormous traction in our own day. As computer technology has advanced, even ordinary people have become accustomed to the idea popularized by science fiction that artificial machines might eventually become as conscious and intelligent as we are. This is the natural corollary of the idea that we ourselves are just machines made of meat, as in the famous words of Marvin Minsky, one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence research. Many factors have contributed to this development. The defeat of vitalism in the 19th century promised that the same reductive methods of uh, reductive modes of explanation that have been so successful in physics would unlock the secrets of biology as well, as indeed they have to a remarkable degree. And Darwinian evolution, by showing the continuity that exists between ourselves and the lower animals, weakened belief in human exceptionalism. But a decisive shift had already occurred much earlier with the discoveries of Isaac Newton, whose laws of gravity and mechanics had two profoundly important features. First, they were universal. They governed everything, from the motions of great planets to the minutest constituents of matter. Second, they were deterministic. They implied that the state of the physical world at one time completely and uniquely determines its state at all future times. The classic statement of physical determinism was given by the great mathematical physicist Pierre Simon Laplace in 1819, quote, to an intelligence which could know all the forces by which nature is animated and the states at some instant of all the objects that compose it, nothing would be uncertain and the future as well as the past would be present to its eyes, unquote. Every discovery in physics in the century that followed bore out this bold assertion. When, for example, the complete laws of electricity and magnetism were written down by James Clark Maxwell in the 1860s, they were seen to be as rigidly deterministic as Newton's laws of mechanics and gravity. The universality and determinism of the laws of physics gave rise to the belief that the entire physical universe is a complete and closed system of cause and effect. This is often called by philosophers the principle of the causal closure of the physical world. According to this principle, physical events can have only physical causes. And, no, and, and therefore, if non-physical entities exist, they can have no effect on the world of matter. 
Whether you have a spiritual soul would be irrelevant, at least to your act actions, since it could not affect what you say or do, or, what, or even what is going on in your brain. Your brain is as much, as much as the rest of your body would be under the inflexible control of the laws of physics. Freedom, at least freedom of action, would be impossible. One might say that this was nothing new. There have been thinkers since ancient times who denied the reality of human freedom, claiming that our thoughts and deeds were governed by the fate or by the stars. But these ideas are the fruit of mere speculation. What made the Newtonian challenge to free will more pressing was that it came from a powerful scientific synthesis that proved its validity in countless ways <clears throat> over hundreds of years of painstaking uh, research. This doesn't mean that scientists immediately abandoned belief in free will or in, a, or in a spiritual soul that animates our bodies. In fact, many, if not most, of the great scientists up until about the mid-19th century, including Newton and Maxwell, uh, rejected the causal closure of the physical world and the physicalist picture of human beings it entails. Nevertheless, these ideas slowly gained ground. For many thinkers, they are now axiomatic. In the remainder of this talk, I'm going to sketch five pieces of evidence or lines of argument that suggest that there is more to the human mind than physicalism can explain. Some of these are based on ordinary human experience, and some are based on profound and revolutionary developments in physics and mathematics. The first piece of evidence is the phenomenon of consciousness, which I will argue cannot be explained in purely physical terms. Even animals, who lack the spiritual powers of reason and free will, seem to have consciousness. So what I am arguing is that physicalism fails even to account for mental phenomena that fall far short of the spiritual level. That is one reason that some well-known philosophers who do not believe in the human spiritual soul, such as Thomas Nagel and David Chalmers, nevertheless reject the physicalist picture of the mind. Instead of talking about consciousness in general, let us focus on one kind of conscious experience, color sensation. Can physics explain why an apple looks red? If asked this question, many scientists and scientifically knowledgeable people would instantly and emphatically answer yes. They would say that red light consists of electromagnetic waves whose wavelength falls within a certain range, about 620 to 750 nanometers. They would say that physics can explain why the skin of an apple tends to reflect light of those wavelengths better than light of other wavelengths. They would then talk about our sensory apparatus, including the cone cells in our retinas, the visual cortex of our brain, our brains, and so on, and how these allow us to distinguish light of different wavelengths. But, that does, not, but does all that add up to an explanation of our subjective experience of redness. It does not. For as several contemporary philosophers have emphasized, a person who was born blind could have complete understanding of physics and of the human visual system and how it worked and still have no idea what the sensation of redness is like. Moreover, physicists and engineers build apparatuses that detect and distinguish light of different frequencies, of different wavelengths, all the time. And it would be easy to build one that would print out or speak the word red when confronted with a red object, or yellow when presented with yellow objects. But such a device would completely lack consciousness. It would no, have no sensation of red or yellow, no subjective experience of color at all. It would no more experience color than a thermostat or thermometer feels warm or cold. Some physicalists, perhaps most of them, would say that this is only because the devices we are able to build are not sufficiently complex. If we could build something as complex as a human brain, or even a mouse brain, then it might well have consciousness, they say. The issue, however, is not complexity. It is not the number of neurons in the brain or the number of connections they have to each other. It is a question of the very nature of physics. According to physics, every physical system 
is completely characterized, indeed defined, by a set of mathematical variables that describe what its constituent parts are doing. These variables might, for example, be the positions of particles. How these variables change with time is governed by a set of mathematical rules and equations, the laws of physics. Most physicists believe that if one knew what all the variables of a physical system were doing and the mathematical laws governing them, one could, in principle, derive everything there was to know about the system's properties and behavior. This derivation could be carried out using only the rules of mathematics and logic. This is sometimes called physical reductionism. It is the spectacular success of this kind of reductionism in explaining so much about the world around us that underlies the confidence of physicalists that it can be extended to explain everything. It seems obvious, however, that it cannot be applied to consciousness. Even if one knew all the variables of a physical system at one time or at all times and the equations governing them, there would be no way to derive from those numbers and equations any conclusion about whether the system you were dealing with was conscious, was feeling anything, or was having subjective experiences of any sort. Of course, we sometimes infer from the physically observable behavior of a being that it is having feelings. When my dog eats a piece of bacon, I'm sure it is enjoying the taste. But that conclusion is based on an analogy between the dog's reactions and mine, not on a mathematical or logical derivation from measurable facts, as is done in physics. Nor could it ever be. For such things as the taste of bacon, the scent of a lilac, or the sensation of the color pink are not quantities. And physics deals only with quantities, quantities that appear in equations and quantities that are measured. In other words, it isn't just that we don't yet know how to give a physical explanation of consciousness or sensory experience. It is that physics, by the very way it explains phenomena through mathematical and logical analysis, cannot, in principle, explain those things. As the great physicist Erwin Schrodinger observed, quote, all scientific knowledge is based on sense perceptions, but the scientific views of natural processes formed in this way lack all sensual qualities and therefore cannot account for the latter. Unquote. Now there are some philosophers who would concede all this, but who still hold to the axiom of the causal closure of the physical world. They would agree that our consciousness, our subjective experiences, including our sensory experiences, are not something physical, and therefore cannot be explained by physics alone. But they would still insist that all of our behavior, what we do, what we write, what we say, and so on, must have a complete explanation in terms of physics alone because our behavior always consists of physical movements of parts of our bodies. And the principle of causal closure requires that all physical phenomena must have only physical explanations. This would apply also to the activity in our brain, since our brains are physical organs. So these philosophers, who accept causal closure, but realize that consciousness is not physical, distinguish two parts or aspects of the human mind, or of the mind in general. One part of the mind has subjective experiences, and therefore they agree cannot be reduced to physics, but also by the principle of cause of closure cannot affect anything physical, including the behavior of the being having those experiences. The second part of the mind is responsible for all behavior, and thus by the principle of cause of closure must be entirely reducible to physics. So while these philosophers are not complete physicalists, they relegate anything non-physical about our minds to a completely passive and thus utterly superfluous and ineffectual status. One philosopher who takes this position is David Chalmers, who wrote a very influential book in 1997 called The Conscious Mind in Search of a Fundamental Theory. 
Now, the very fact that Chalmers wrote a book about consciousness creates a very serious difficulty for his philosophical position. Why? Because his writing a book was a form of behavior. He had to type with his fingers and so forth. And there is no way in his scheme that his consciousness, which according to him is in the non-physical and thus purely passive and ineffectual part of his mind, can have had, had any influence on what happened in his brain or what his fingers typed. What he typed was determined entirely by physical causes, forces, and his consciousness could have had no part in it, according to his philosophy. Indeed, by his theory, he would have typed exactly the same words even if he had no consciousness at all. Therefore, to put it bluntly, if Chalmers' views are right, we cannot learn anything about consciousness, his or anyone else's, by reading the book that his fingers typed or listening to the sounds that come out of his mouth. Chalmers was aware of this problem and struggled with it unsuccessfully. Here's what he said about it in his book. Quote, one might conclude that the physical portion of me, my brain, say, is not justified in its belief that I am conscious. But the question is whether I am justified in my belief, not whether my brain is justified in its belief. There is more to me than my brain. I know I am conscious. I know I am conscious. And the knowledge is based solely upon my immediate experience." Unquote. Now, as I pointed out in a review of his book, Chalmers may know more than his brain does. But according to Chalmers' own theory, it is his brain that wrote the book, his book. Indeed, his brain wrote those very sentences that I have just quoted. And one wonders how it could write so knowledgeably about all the things that Chalmers knows and his brain does not. Chalmers' predicament is instructive. It shows you that you cannot consistently quarantine consciousness from the rest of the mind so that it is unable to affect our behavior. It is obvious that our consciousness does affect our behavior. Our conscious experience does affect our behavior. In particular, it obviously affects our behavior whenever we speak or write about our own conscious experience, as Chalmers did. Moreover, if consciousness did not affect behavior, it would be useless. Why would animals have evolved consciousness in the first place if it did not affect their behavior? Unless it affected their behavior, it would not affect their chances of surviving and reproducing. Now, if consciousness does affect our behavior, as I have just argued, it must, and if it is not something physical, as I've argued previously, it cannot be, then the principle of causal closure of the physical world must be false. It simply cannot be true that physical events have only physical, can have only physical causes. Let us now leave consciousness aside and turn to another phenomenon that points to the falsity of physicalism, our capacity to understand abstract concepts. This pertains to our reason a spiritual power that we have, but animals lack. What is an abstract concept? Perhaps this is best explained by examples. If you think about a particular woman, you are not thinking abstractly. But if you think about womanliness, you are. Abstract terms such as womanliness, truth, impossibility, justice, or triangularity are what medieval philosophers called universal. The word, word triangularity, for instance, is a universal because it does not refer to this or that triangular object, this piece of wood or that slice of cake, but to all real or possible triangular objects. Indeed, it can be understood apart from any concrete example of triangularity. When we think of a universal term apart from any particular object, we are engaged in truly abstract thought. Abstract thought, then, has in a sense, an unlimited reach. It transcends what is here and now in the particularities of specific objects to embrace a concept that is infinite in scope. For this reason, a philosophical tradition going back to at least Plato and Aristotle has argued that nothing which is merely material can engage in abstract thought. The argument is simple. A particular material entity can exemplify an abstract Concept, the way a piece of wood or a slice of cake can exemplify triangularity. But no material object can exemplify all ways of being triangular, equilateral triangles, right triangles, and so on, 
for there are infinitely many triangular shapes. Or take the concept of a mathematical function. The orbit of a comet around the sun may exemplify a specific mathematical, mathematical function, such as a parabola or hyperbola, but no particular material entity or system can exemplify all mathematical functions. The full range of an abstract concept cannot be inscribed, as it were, in a particular finite material system or thing. And therefore, it cannot be inscribed in the human brain. Thus, when the human mind understands an abstract concept or grasps the meaning of a universal term, something more than the brain must be involved. I'm focusing on abstract concepts from mathematics for two reasons. First, because mathematics is the realm in which abstract thought is at its purest and most precise. And second, because the theories of modern physics are constructed from mathematical concepts. If the materialist philosopher cannot make sense of the abstract concepts of mathematics, he will not be able to make sense of physics itself. And that would be an enormous embarrassment to his position because his ambition is to reduce everything to physics. So let's look at the abstract mathematical concepts called numbers. What are they? What is the physicalist or materialist to make of the number four? It's not a physical object, obviously, but maybe it is an aspect of physical objects. For example, one might think of it as an aspect of a four-sided table or a four-footed animal. That might work for the number four, but it won't work for most numbers. For example, it won't work for the number pi or the number the seventh root of 19. Some might be tempted to say that the number pi is an aspect of circular objects, but there are no exactly circular objects in the physical world. And it is impossible to see how the seventh root of 19 can be an aspect of any material object. Many philosophers would say, and I would agree, that numbers are neither material objects nor just aspects of material objects, but rather are mental objects. You cannot touch a number as you can touch a table, but you can think a number. Numbers exist in minds. This is of no help to the materialist, however, because he sees minds themselves as merely the functioning of material systems, brains. For instance, the famous biologist Francis Crick wrote that you, your, sorrow, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules, unquote. The former editor of Nature, Sir John Maddox, wrote, quote, an explanation of the mind must ultimately be an explanation in terms of the way neurons function, unquote. And an article in Newsweek explained the implications of some neuroscience experiments this way. Quote, thoughts are not mere will-o'-the-wisps, ephemera with no physicality. They are instead electrical signals, unquote. Well, if thoughts are electrical signals and numbers are thoughts, then are we to conclude that the numbers pi and the seventh root of 19 are just elect electrical signals in someone's central nervous system? Indeed, some would go that far. A, sci an, a science article in the New York Times some years ago averred that, quote, numbers are neurological creations, unquote. So all of mathematics, all of theoretical physics, including quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity and Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism and so forth, are just electrical signals in the nervous systems of certain members of a certain species of animal. That gives them no more status than a toothache. Such a view has severe difficulties. One difficulty is to explain how two people can both be thinking about the same number. If two people both think about the number pi, their brains are certainly not in the same physical state. A second difficulty with this point of view I've already discussed, the full range of an abstract concept being infinite cannot be inscribed in any particular material, finite material system, such as a brain. Now, an objection might occur to someone at this point. Don't we express mathematics in symbols and formulas written on paper, on blackboards, or in electronic form in a computer? 
maybe mathematics is not a matter of abstract concepts or thoughts in a mind at all, but just a matter of manipulation of symbols and formulas, which clearly can be inscribed in various material systems. There is a school of thought in the philosophy of mathematics that takes this view. It's called formalism. There is some plausibility to it. After all, much of mathematics can be done by the mechanical manipulation of symbols. Think of what you do when you do long division, for example. And that is why computers can do mathematical calculations and even mathematical proofs. I'll come back to discuss the formalist viewpoint very soon, but first I want to discuss another capacity of the human mind that raises severe difficulties for physicalists, namely the mind's capacity to recognize truth. The problem this raises for physicalism is the following. If my thoughts follow a path set out for them by the laws of, that govern matter, as the physicalist believes, then how does truth come into the picture? In the final analysis, my thoughts are not guided by truth. They're just the thoughts that I must have given the way the molecular motions in my brain and the rest of the world have happened to play out. In 1932, the famous biologist J.B.S. Haldane made the following argument, quote, if materialism is true, it seems to me that we cannot know that it is true. If my opinions are the result of the chemical processes going on in my brain, they're determined by chemistry, not the laws of logic, unquote. Essentially, the same point had been made earlier by G.K. Chesterton in his book, Orthodoxy. He noted that the materialist skeptic must sooner or later ask, quote, why should anything go right, even observation and deduction? Why should not good logic be as mis misleading as bad logic? They're both movements in the brain of a bewildered ape. Recently, Stephen Hawking worried about the same issue in, correct, in connection with the so-called theory of everything which many physicists are seeking. A theory of physics that explained everything, or at least everything physical, he said, would also have to explain why some people believed it and some people did not. Their belief or disbelief in the theory <coughs> would therefore be the result of inevitable physical processes in their brains rather than being the result of the validity of the arguments made in behalf of the theory itself. Interestingly, Haldane eventually reversed his position and came to embrace physicalism. What led him to change his mind was the development of the computer, which demonstrated that a machine, though bound by physical laws, could nonetheless follow the laws of logic. The reason Haldane ended up being misled is that he did not frame the issue in quite the right way to begin with. The real issue is not whether a machine can follow the laws of logic. Certainly it can. If designed and programmed properly, a machine that follows one set of rules, the laws of physics, can, by doing so, also follow another set of rules, the laws of logic, or arithmetic, or chess. The real question is whether a machine that only blindly follows rules of whatever kind can be open to the truth. The answer seems to be no. Even if we restrict our attention to the realm of mathematics, Openness to truth involves more than mere mechanical rule following. That seems to be the lesson of one of the great discoveries of the 20th century, Gödel's theorem. Before the great logician Kurt Gödel proved his theorem in 1931, the school of thought called formalism, to which I already alluded, was very influential in the world of mathematics. According to the formalists, all of mathematical reasoning can be reduced to symbolic manipulations that follow prescribed rules. So all of mathematical thinking could be reduced to operations that a machine, such as a computer, could perform. According to the formalists, to say that a mathematical proposition is true simply means that it can be derived from certain prescribed formulas called axioms by following prescribed rules. Consequently, the following of mechanical rules could give access to all of mathematical truth, all mathematical truth. 
1931, Gödel stunned the mathematical world by showing that this view of mathematical truth is inadequate. He showed that no matter how many rules one prescribes, there will always remain infinitely many truths of mathematics that cannot be reached merely by following those rules mechanically. Even in the bloodless realm of mathematics, the power of reason and its ability to reach the truth involves something more than machine-like behavior. In 1961, John R. Lucas, a philosopher at Oxford, set forth an argument based on Gödel's theorem to the effect that the human mind cannot be merely a computer program. He wrote, quote, Gödel's theorem seems to me to prove that mechanism is false. That is, that human minds cannot be explained as machines. So also has it seemed to many other people. Almost every mathematical logician I have put the matter to has confessed to similar thoughts. In a brief space, I, cert I cannot attempt to set out the whole argument, but I can try to give some sense of what's involved. Gödel's theorem pertains to what are called consistent formal systems. One can think of a formal system as a set of mechanical rules for arriving at, math at mathematical conclusions. Gödel showed that if one understands the rules of any such system, one can outwit it in a sense. One can construct a mathematical proposition that is true and whose truth one can see by the very process by which one constructed it, but which the system itself cannot ever see the truth of that is, cannot arrive at as a conclusion by following its mechanical rules. Such propositions are called Gödel propositions. In other words, by understanding the rules, you can see the truth of certain things that you can't see just by following the rules. A simple analogy can help. An adding machine whose rules only allow it to add any two particular whole numbers can arrive at certain truths, such as 2 plus 4 equals 6 or 24 plus 66 equals 90. But it cannot arrive at the mathematical truth that the sum of any two even numbers is an even number. You and I, however, because we don't just follow the rules of the adding machine, but understand those rules, can see why adding two even numbers always gives an even number. Understanding the rules of a formal system and being able to reason about them can lead one to, to true conclusions that cannot be reached just by following those rules mechanically, as I said. So, so asked Lucas, what if in doing mathematics, I am just a machine, a brain, following prescribed rules? That is a formal system, in a sense. Suppose I learn the rules that my brain employs to do mathematics. I somehow learn the, my own program. If I understand those rules, then Gödel showed me how to construct a mathematical proposition whose truth I cannot see, but uh, that I can, I can see from the process by which I constructed it, but whose truth my brain cannot recognize, i.e. arrive at just by following its own rules. But this contradicts the assumption that I am just that rule-following brain. Lucas's argument did not have much impact at the time, however, in 1989, the eminent mathematician Roger Penrose developed the argument further and vigorously defended it in a book called The Emperor's New Mind. This provoked much debate, some of it which appeared in the journal Behavioral and Brain Sciences. This led Penrose to, re to refine his argument in a second book, Shadows of the Mind, published in 1995. One could best summarize the situation by saying that while the Lucas Penrose argument has not convinced skeptics, it has not been refuted either. What is it about the human mind that sets it above mere machines? It is our ability not merely to manipulate symbols, but to understand the meaning of those symbols and the propositions constructed out of them, and to judge the truth and falsity or falsity of those propositions. Hermann Weyl, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, said the following in a lecture at Yale, or a series of lectures at Yale in 1931. Quote, Descartes brings out the decisive point with particular clarity. 
when he demonstrates the, that the freedom involved, when he demonstrates the freedom involved in the theoretical acts of affirmation and negation. When I reason that two plus two equals four, this actual judgment is not forced upon me through blind natural causality, a view which would eliminate thinking as an act for which one can be held accountable, answerable. But something purely spiritual enters in, unquote. Weil went on to explain that the mind, if completely determined by factors that are below it, such as chemis chemical reactions in the brain, would not be free with respect to those factors, and thus not open to those non-material realities that are above it, such as truth and meaning. Our thinking would therefore be, as he put it, groundless and blind. This is indeed the decisive point. Our openness to truth not only demonstrates that we are intellectually free, but explains what that freedom is for and why it is important. Truth cannot enter us into a soul that is not first open to it. It cannot move a mind whose movements are already dictated by blind natural causality. The same is true of moral freedom. The soul cannot be open to the morally good if its movements are determined by the blind natural causality of physics, chemistry, and biology. This is profoundly in harmony with the passage I quoted earlier from the Catechism, which spoke of man's openness to truth and beauty, his sense of moral goodness, and his freedom as evidence of a spiritual soul not reducible to the merely material. At this point, one runs into an objection based on physics. As I mentioned earlier, for centuries there was mounting evidence that the laws of physics are deterministic. That is, that they rigidly determine how events will unfold. This created great difficulties for the idea of human freedom and was a powerful argument in favor of the causal closure of the physical world. So, are the laws of physics deterministic? This brings me to my final topic, quantum mechanics. In the 1920s, theoretical physics underwent a revolution. Its conceptual foundations were changed in a profound way. And these new foundations, to everyone's surprise, were non-deterministic. According to the principles of quantum mechanics, the state of a physical system at one time does not rigidly determine its future, as Laplace had famously said, but only determines the relative probabilities of different possible futures. All of a sudden, one of the great, most powerful arguments against free will was swept aside. Let me quote again from the mathematician Hermann Weyl uh, from the same 1931 lectures. Quote, we may say that there exists a world causally closed and determined by precise laws, but the new insight which modern quantum physics affords opens several ways of reconciling personal freedom with the laws of physics. It would be premature, however, to propose a definite and complete solution of the problem. We must await the further development of science, perhaps for centuries, perhaps for thousands of years, before we can design a true and detailed picture of the interwoven texture of matter, life, and soul. But the old classical determinism of Hobbes and Laplace need not oppress us longer." Unquote. There's another way in which quantum mechanics has profound implications about the nature of mind. According to several great physicists of the 20th century, quantum mechanics is not consistent with a materialist view of the human mind. For instance, Sir Rudolf Peierls said, quote, the premise that you can describe in terms of physics the whole function of a human being, including its knowledge and consciousness, is untenable, unquote. And the Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner wrote that materialism is, quote, inconsistent with present quantum mechanics, unquote. The reason they say this has to do with what is historically called the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. The systems that are measured are always physical. But one runs into difficulty, if, into a difficulty, if one assumes that the person doing the measurement is purely physical. The reason for the difficulty has to do with the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. 
As I mentioned before, according to the principles of quantum mechanics, the equations of physics do not in general tell you what is definitely going to happen, generally speaking, but only the relative probabilities of various outcomes. However, when a person makes a measurement or observation of the physical world, he or she always obtains a definite result. That means that a contradiction arises if one tries to describe everything going on and everything involved in that measurement, not only the system being measured, but the measurer himself, by the equations of physics. For those equations yield only probabilities and not definite results. That is why Professor Hans Halverson, a distinguished philosopher of physics at Princeton University, writes, quote, in the case of quantum mechanics, if one presupposes physicalism, then one quickly lands in the measurement problem, unquote. And that is why some physicists have argued that mind and consciousness are not reducible to matter. To quote Eugene Wigner again, the very study of the physical world led to the conclusion that the content of the consciousness is an ultimate reality, unquote. I've come to the end of my talk, so let me summarize. We've seen that there are several arguments against the physicalist view that everything, including the human mind, is entirely reducible to matter and its laws. There's the fact of consciousness. There's the human capacity to think abstractly. There's our openness to meaning and truth. There are the indications coming from two of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century, Gödel's theorem and quantum mechanics, that the human mind is not merely a physical mechanism. And there is the discovery that the laws of physics are not deterministic, which removes one of the great one of the main obstacles to belief in free will. To repeat the words of the Catechism, in his openness to truth and beauty, his sense of moral goodness, his freedom and the voice of his conscience, man finds evidence of his spiritual soul, which is irreducible to the merely material. And of course, man also finds his dignity. Thank you. Friends, we have time for a few questions. Ah, uh-oh. I'm afraid of philosophers. They're, they're much better. Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> Ooh. Um, Stephen, thank you. That extraordinarily clear. Clear. And then, of course, the nice, things, nice thing about clarity that we philosophers like is it promises. A little louder. I, I think the, ni the nice thing about clarity that we philosophers like is it uh, makes it easier to ask questions. So it, it, it exposes all the flaws in my argument to, no, to plain it's not, sight. It's, 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 it's not so much a, a flaw. I, I want to ask a sort of broader question, and that right. is I've got no truck with physicalism, with materialism, and so on. Right. But the worry one might have would be the sense that we understand what it is to say spiritual or more broadly immaterial uh, and so on, right? So God is an immaterial being. What does that tell me? Well, he's not material. Well, what he, he's, wait, he's not material. Is he's not material. That's what right. immaterial means. Yeah. And, now, spiritual is not a nice word like that where you can just say, oh, the prefix uh, functions as a negation. Spiritual seems to have a very robust sense to it, but it seems to mean just, well, sort of transcends the physical. But what that raises then is the question of, well, what do we mean by the physical? And it seems as though the sorts of physicalism that we're sort of all opposed to begin with a kind of assumption that, well, in its own domain, say, physics, or you could, whatever your favorite science is, chemistry, biology, in its own domain, there's this domain of reality that is adequately explained by the science, right? Or ideally will be, say. And then anything else would be something other than that, a different sort of realm. And then we have the problem of, um, well, so how is it that the spiritual affects the non-closed material or physical? But we still think there's this sort of realm that's a self-standing thing and then another realm. Right. And I wonder if another way to approach it so that we don't get caught up with sort of two-round sort of thinking, 
mean, when I walk to the store, I'm, uh, I don't want to think that I'm doing something immaterial. I'm doing something material and so on. And it's me walking and so on. Um, my, one way to challenge physicalism, because I think all the arguments you give are really good arguments, and I've actually relied upon them in other contexts. Well, they're actually there's Aristotelian some of them, so. <laughs> but might it be worth thinking about whether or not it is, while true, say, a science like physics, while true of the physical is not adequate to the physical. That is, that there's a kind of richness to, to being uh, beyond a particular way of approaching it. I'm thinking here in particular in the way in which um, Jacques, uh, I've got disagreements with Maritain despite directing the center name for him, but the idea of a mode of abstraction that leaves things out in order to achieve things within the science, but it's not as if what it's doing is grabbing onto levels, right? It's uh -huh. getting at the richness without adequately capture. I understand. Actually, I'll send you a talk I'm, I haven't written yet, but I'm giving this summer, which I'm going to be criticizing people like Maritans. <laughs> First of all, it's clear I'm not trying to lay out a positive philosophical approach here. I'm essentially attacking physicalism as held by many, not most, but many scientists, many philosophers who are inspired by modern physics. And so I'm saying taking it on their own terms. I'm saying let's, let's take their assumptions about what about the physical world and, 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 and what physics is able to explain and how it explains it, and show that that, is in a, it, that that cannot get you to certain phenomena, even ones that fall short of the spiritual, such as animal consciousness. Even there, it fails. That kind of phys thoroughgoing physicalism fails, even before you get to the spiritual. I would say, I'm not defining, making a, a contrast, uh, I'm not get, uh, putting, saying that there is a, a uh, dichotomy it's an exhaustive dichotomy between the spiritual and the physical. I would define the physical as that which involves freedom and, and intellect. Now, what are they? At a certain level, at a certain point, you can't define them. They're basic realities that are not reducible to anything else. Uh, um, now, God's spiritual, but of course, we only understand God analogically. So I'm going to talk about, I mean, I'm talking about spiritual, I'm talking about the spirituality of human beings. And I, I'm saying that is, what I mean by that are the powers of reason and, and, and free will. That's what I mean. Now, what do I mean by the physical? Actually, this is not going to make you happy with me, I think, but I actually, to some extent, I share a lot of the physicalist's view of things. My own, but this is just me personally. I actually think that the physicalists are right up to a point. That is, I personally believe that when you come to inanimate, inanimate physical things, things that have no subjectivity, no, don't have experiences. And I would say even when you come to plants, a living things that have no interiority, no subjectivity, I do believe that physics can give, in some sense, and I won't go, it's a long discussion, an exhaustive account that they can be understood entirely, ultimately, in terms of physics. Um, now, there's a mystery because there are things that I think are beyond physics, but are not spiritual, but as I say, animals. That's a mysterious thing. Um, I don't know how that works. I don't think anybody knows how that works. Uh, anybody who claims to understand how animals can be conscious is fooling himself. <laughs> I think it's a profound mystery. So I'd say, um, I don't, I, I agree that, so animal consciousness, now if animals are thought of as purely material beings, I would make a distinction between material and physical in a way. For me, physics is about, physics has to do with equations. It has to do with that which can be explained in mathematical, in terms of its mathematical structure. I can understand this microphone. I can understand inanimate things entirely in terms of mathematical structure of those things. But I would say, in a certain sense, a dog is a mater purely material object, a thing, an object, a thing, an entity. And yet, there's something about a dog that is not reducible to physics in that sense. As I said, even if you understood everything there was to know about the math, the structure, the physical structure of the dog, all the variables, everything. 
you wouldn't get it. So there's something about the dog that escapes that. So I agree, there's a richness in the material world, when, especially when it comes to animals, the, the sentient being, that escapes physics. And that, I think, is a profound mystery. So I'll agree with you, yes. There's something about the material world that escapes physics, but I, I think it only arises, as far as I can tell, it only arises at the point in which, where you have things which have in some sort of subjectivity or experience. Yeah. Well, I also very much appreciate that uh, we had this talk as part of a conference on human dignity. Um, because in essence, uh, you could say this materialist, physicalist view of what human beings are is the main, one of the main major stumbling blocks. Um, I, uh, I was very taken uh, when I read um, uh, Thomas Nagel's book, Mind and Cosmos, uh, because it is such a kind of uh, profound confession uh, right. by somebody who is, you could say, uh, almost congenitally committed to a physicalist explanation that he could not live with it any longer. And yet he has no answer that adequately satisfies him. I think, you know, that's an, that was an impressive testament uh, because it sort of is a cry from the heart that the big problem is not that we can't defeat phys this physicalist, reductionist uh, view, but that we have nothing to put in its place. In other words, there's no paradigm uh, in Thomas Kuhn's uh, notion of it, uh, that we can't take this uh, alternative, um, or more expansive human dignity perspective really on board in a world where the dominant paradigm is materialist, reductionist. Right. Um, I think that's more of a challenge than we appreciate. Uh, and I thought the great value of Nagel's book was that uh, he, here was a guy who was really admitting to it, uh, the, what, what uh, Tom Stafford in his play calls the hard problem. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know, that, it is really a hard problem, and it's not a problem just for to be defeated by argument, but by a new paradigm. And that's uh, something that's out there. Right. That's why people like Chalmers and Nagel are so valuable, because they reject the supernatural. They don't believe that there's a spiritual side of things. Nagel would deny he was a physicalist. He doesn't, he's, I don't know what his earlier views are, but at least in that book, he's not a physicalist. He says he's in favor of some sort of neutral monism. Uh, but he's a, he's a monist of some sort. Uh, but um, yes, that's right. There, sometime, every once in a while, someone who, both Nagel and Chalmers, are, believe it, are, are metaphysical naturalists. And every once in a while, one of these metaphysical naturalists of great high reputation admits, makes a, a public admission, which is that, 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 certain at, that, that the physicalist view is, is simply inadequate. It just simply doesn't work. Of course, they take a lot of suffer a lot of obloquy from their professional peers when they do that. But it's always nice to have those admissions. <laughs>